today on Ask This Old House. Most water heaters have a five to 10 year warranty, but now there are some that are warrantied for life. I'll explain. This is a 50 gallon tank. It was about 1,200 bucks. That's so a lot, right? two to three times more than a conventional uh, glass line steel tank. That's something. Okay. And there's more than one way to build a box, and we'll show you how to build it. The trick to this is making the jig. And if you're repointing brick, you're going to want the new mortar to match the old mortar, and I'll give you tips on how to do it. You just give it a couple seconds to dry, and then we just kind of eyeball what we're trying to match. That's next on Ask This Old House. Hey, Richard. Hey, Kevin. So you've obviously gotten the email from Stacy in North Carolina. She did. She writes that she walked into the home center and she sees a plastic water heater. First time she's ever seen That's that. Right. And it had a lifetime warranty. Right. And now she's thinking, like, is this her next water heater? Well, you know what? I had never installed one of these. I've been out for a little while, so I went out to the home center. This is a 50-gallon tank. It was about 1200 bucks. Mm, that's so a lot, right? So two to three times more than a conventional uh, glass line steel tank. That's something. Okay, it's a plastic tank. There's a warranty for the lifetime on the tank itself. It's got more insulation, two inches of insulation right here. So, but the tank has often been the issue why water heaters fail. Here's the inside of what we've always used. This is the standard tank in America. This is a glass lined steel tank. This right. happens to be gas fired but the electric would have an element that sticks in right here. Mm -hmm. Now, when you have water, you're gonna have the chance for corrosion and electrolysis. It wants to eat anything that's ferrous, anything that's metal. Right. Now, the way to get around that electrolysis has always been to put an anode rod. This is a sacrificial rod that sits down inside the tank yep. made out of manganese or aluminum, very ignoble metal so it can take all the electrolysis here. This is what it should look like. <laughs> This is what it ends up looking like. And once that fails, it's going to make the tank leak. And, and that's why the warranty on these old tanks is what? Five or six years, seven You're years? You're lucky to get five, six, seven years. Sometimes the warranty is five, sometimes it's ten. You're of the mindset that that's going to fail no matter what you do Absolutely. eventually. Absolutely. They're almost planned to fail. So are you suggesting that you know because of that comparison, this is the way to go? I don't know that for sure yet. I mean, it depends on what decision filter you want to apply. Right. If it was on efficiency only, I was really surprised that the electrical efficiency is not that much a savings. This is about five or ten percent better than this one. I thought it would have been a little bit more. It took a long time right. to make that up when right. you pay twelve hundred bucks right. up front. Then the warranty is only on the tank. It's not on the parts. So inside this tank, to heat the water, it has two of these. What is this made out of? This electric element. Steel. It's made out of steel. So now that's going to sit inside the water. So it means that someday short of a lifetime, these elements are going to have to be changed. So that means you're not, it means if you have a tank like this, you're going to have to see a plumber someday to change the elements and, and replace them. You won't have to change an anode, but you will have to do those. And then the final question is how long you stay in the house. If you pay three times more, will you stay in long enough to enjoy it? So it all comes down to what she wants to buy. That's right. All right, but th that's good information to have so she can make that decision. That's right. All right, thank you. Want to tackle all your home improvement projects with confidence? Join This Old House Insider, a new streaming service from This Old House, the iconic Emmy-winning series that inspired a generation of home enthusiasts. Stream over 1,000 episodes of This Old House and Ask This Old House commercial free. Watch it all in the This Old House app and join live online Q&As with our experts. Best of all, you can try Insider free for seven days. To join, go to thisoldhousemembership.com. Hey. Thanks for coming by. No problem. I wasn't sure which door to go to. I know. We sort of have two front doors, and we use this one, which leads to the foyer, but we would love to welcome guests at this door. I was hoping you could make it more attractive. Really good. What you got in mind? I was hoping we could paint it maybe black. I think black is look good. Black shutters, black doors. Nice. Awesome. My one concern is that it's metal, so I'm, I don't want to mess it up. I can definitely help you out with that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Lorelai, you said that you want black for your front door. Yes. Which black do you like? Black. Okay, just like any other color, there are different shades. I'm going to show you four colors here. If you look on their own, they look black. But when you compare them, there's differences. Oh, yeah. So we have like red undertone, light gray, green, or dark blue. Which one do you think you would like? 
Well. Well, let me get it this close to your door. Okay. So you can have a better idea. So, what do you think? Ooh, I like the top right. This one here? Yeah. Okay, let's remove the door off hinges so it's much easier to paint the door on a horizontal surface. With the door on the sawhorses, we can remove the hardware. Let's go to the second one. Well, door comes prime from the manufacturer. We're gonna lightly sand with the 400 grit sandpaper. That's it, it's not very rough. Exactly. We don't want to put any scratch on this door. Okay. All right. We want to get all the dust off with the HEPA vac and the brush attachment. And then we'll wipe it down with a wet rag. Okay. Our door is ready for paint. Um, Metal is different from wooden. Wooden door has pour and helps to absorb some of the paint. If we use a regular latex paint on metal, the paint is just going to sit on the surface and it's going to get damaged the first rainstorm. For this metal door, we're going to use DTM or direct to metal paint and a specific design to adhere to metal. I'm going to pour some of this paint and we're going to start to do the work. Okay, we're gonna dip in the brush just a little bit. That's good enough. So we're gonna start by painting. Well, we're gonna start by cutting with the angle brush around the paint. Just like that. So Laurel, you got the idea? You wanna try it? Sure. All right, let me get you this paint here to you. You can start this molding and I'll keep going on this one here. That's good. Just dip the brush a little bit. Yep, sounds good. We want to keep the paint just inside the panels. We do not want to put a lot of paint on the styles and rails. That looks good, Lola. Yeah, see? Thank you. Nice. This looks a little watery. Exactly. It's a water-based paint, but it's spread nice and smooth. It just looks like a, an oil-based finish. We're going to switch to a foam roller. That is going to minimize the brush stroke marks. Try to cover all the areas on your first stroke, all right? So that long strokes, long strokes. Don't put a lot of pressure, just like a medium pressure on it, all right? It's been two hours, it's really dry. It's time for to put the second coat on. Once the second coat is dry, we'll reattach the hardware and hang the door back. All right, what do you think? It looks terrific, I love it. Okay, let's tell you one thing. Door is completely open to the elements. A darker color like this will fade faster than a lighter color. You should be looking out to paint this door again between the three to five years. I can do that now. Thank you so much, Mauro. Now you can watch This Old House and Ask This Old House anytime, anywhere. Download our new app to stream full episodes to your tablet, your TV, and your phone. Binge on classic episodes, catch up on recent renovations, and get step-by-step -step help projects all around the house. And best of all, it's free. The most trusted home improvement information is now available on your Amazon Fire TV, Roku, Apple TV, iOS, and Android devices. Download the This Old House streaming app today. Hey, Mark. Hey, Kevin. So you have shown homeowners how to repoint a brick wall. It's actually quite doable. I mean, right? they've had good success with sure. it. Sure. 
Matching the mortar, however, is where the finesse comes in. That's the tricky part, right. As you can see, most of it is gray yep. on the outside. Uh, if we sent a homeowner to, say, a hardware store or one of the big box stores, they can pick up a bag of premixed, and they're going to get very close. All right. But if they want to go all the way and get an exact match, how do they go about that? Exactly. Well, the first thing we would do is extract a piece of this mortar, mm -hmm. and then we'd break it down, and we'd be able to tell how much lime they've used, how much Portland they've used, and how much sand is used. And those are the three ingredients in all mortar, just those three. Exactly. And the only time that's going to vary is when we add lime to lighten up the color. Yep. So lime, which is almost white. Right. More lime means a lighter mortar. More Portland means a darker mortar. Exactly. And the only thing you're going to have to watch is when you add more Portland or add more lime, you're manipulating the strength of the product. Okay. So you've got two buckets right here. What am I looking at? Are these already mixed? The, these are pre-mixed. This is uh, the gray, the darker gray, so that's heavy Portland. Yep. And as this is lighter, you can tell that's more lime. Okay. And so then what's the process? Just trial and error? The, it's, it's really basically trial and error, exactly. Uh, we have sand for both of these mixes. Okay. So you can just dump that into that one. Be careful because it'll puff up on oh, you. Oh boy, yeah. now you tell me. Right, yeah, right sorry on. about right. that. All up. right. Okay. All right, so mix that up, Kevin. Now don't be afraid to turn that over as much as you can. We don't want to see individual material at this point, so you got to keep mixing until you just see that one color. I'm looking pretty good. I'm looking pretty good, too. Okay, but you can already see the difference, Kevin. Yeah, I'm a lot lighter, even yep. with the sand mixed See that? In right, exactly. So let's start the water. All right, I'll put you in charge of the water. All right. Those. Now, obviously, you start with a little bit of water, because you can't take it out. There you go. Put a little bit in my Ow. I'll hold you, Kevin. That's good. Start with that. You're going to look for that oatmeal consistency. All right, I'm looking good. How am I looking? You're looking good as well. So let's go up top. And I'm going to show you a little trick. Whoa, OK. There you go. Why are we doing this on a piece so, of wood? Well, right away, Kevin, you can see the color difference, right? Yes, I'm okay. much lighter. Right, exactly. So again, heavy lime, heavy Portland. That's the color differentiation. I can kind of pull back. And as this little part dries out, let me pull mine back. Pull yourself back. Yep, that's that's good too. So as soon as this dries out, it's going to get us close to what we're going to look at when it is dry. Okay, Kevin, these are actually looking pretty good right, right now. Let's kind of compare it to our sample. All right, put yours up there. Right All right, there. yep, right there. So now this to that, and then this to that. What does your eye see? I know that uh, Portland cement, before it cures, actually has a, a green to it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm starting to see some green in my dried up mix, and I'm starting to see a little bit of that green that turns to gray here. Yeah. So I think I'm going pretty well. Now I'm looking at you, and right away I can see that gray is really starting to get light. We know that this mix will get lighter as weathering continues. So you are leaning towards... Oh, I yeah. knew it. it Sorry, set up. Okay. All right. So a homeowner, you got it in maybe the first try. A homeowner right. might try three or thirteen, but they can get there eventually. Yes. Um, but that's if we have gray mortar. Right. And I've seen red mortars and a pinkish and even a yellowish. What, right. What's that about? Anytime you see something like that, there's been a dye added to the mortar, oh. and at that point, all you do is you go down to your local brickyard. They'll have a mortar color kit just like we have right here. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and as you can see, a million different swatches for you to take out right. and compare to your joint. So if I find a sample that I think is a good match, am I done? You are done. There's no cure time or anything. That's the dye I go with. That's the dye. Buy a bag of it and mix it or buy pre-mixed? Uh, pre-mixed if you can, absolutely. That is really good. All right, Mark, thank you. All right, Great Kevin, information. thanks. As part of our Generation Next initiative, three young apprentices worked with us on the This Old House job site this season. One of them was Austin Wilson. As you may know, shortly after his time with us, Austin sadly passed away in his sleep from a pre-existing medical condition. It was terrible news for all of us. Austin loved working on our job site and he loved working in wood shops where he got his start when he was just 12 years old. 
So when he saw our shop, well, his eyes lit up, and he asked us if he could work alongside Tommy for a Build It segment. Of course, our answer was yes. And even though Austin is no longer with us, we feel that the project he completed with Tommy is a fitting tribute to his passion for woodworking. And we'd like to share it with you right now. So Austin, good to see you. How you been? Good to see you too. Um, I've been pretty busy with school working on my construction management. How How's about that you? Going? It, it's going. I tell you, it could be a workout in college. <laughs> yeah. Don't get much time to yourself always. Well, today I'm going to show you how to build a box, a simple box. Well, a box is a backbone of just about every project that you build, like a kitchen cabinet, a bureau, a dresser, or even a drawer. But today we're going to build those boxes out of some milled down half inch by six poplar. Nice. All right, to get started, why don't you cut some lengths? Let's get to it. All right. All right, Austin, we're going to make three boxes, and three boxes will be the same size. So we're going to stack three boards together, and then you're going to make two cuts at 10 inches and two more cuts at 13 inches. All right, I got your wood all cut for you. All right, great. Now I'm going to show you a real simple joint right here, but it's not a real strong joint. Okay. It's actually called a rabbited butt joint. Okay. All right, it starts with a square cut on one piece and an L-shaped cut on the other one, which is called a rabbit cut. Okay. There's some glue surface, but I don't think this is strong enough, so we need to add a mechanical fastener. So the first thing we'll need to do is set the height of our dado blade about a 64th of an inch above our material. Then we can eyeball the thickness of the tongue we want to leave on. But to eyeball it, I'm going to take and I'm going to leave the material that I want on this edge against the rip pen. So I take it and I bring it in and I eyeball it just like that. And then I lock it down. Okay, so now when I cut this piece, we're going to stand it up and run it through. Uh -huh. And that tongue will be left on. Now when you're cutting like this, you want to make sure you hold on firmly and go through slowly and don't back up. All right? Using a standard table saw blade to cut our dado, I make one pass around all four sides. Adjust the rip vents and make a second pass on all four sides. Now I cover the joint with glue and assemble the box. We want to work quickly because we don't want it to dry up or skin over. The bottom is just a piece of quarter inch plywood that we've cut to size. And drop that one right down onto the top. To hold everything together, we'll pre-drill holes through the tongues with a countersink bit, and then we'll glue and screw all the joints. That wasn't hard. I don't know if I like the screws really much. All right, well, I'll show you another joint that won't require screws. Yeah, let's get to it. Okay, the next one I want to show you is a rabbit and a dado joint. They go together like this. Now, because it's a rabbit and a dado, there's actually a lot more glue surface to glue, so once the glue is set and dried, we won't need a mechanical fastener. Nice. All right, let me show you how to cut this. The first cut I want to make is this dado right here. I'll use a scrap piece of quarter inch plywood to set the height of my dado blade. And by lining up the side to the outside edge of the blade, I can set my rip fence for the location of the dado. Make sure it's right. Lock it in. To make the rabbit cut, we'll keep the blade height the same and adjust the rip vents. We're using a sacrificial piece of wood against the rip vents so I don't damage the rip vents and also so I don't have to adjust the width of the blade when making my cut. For this box, we'll want to get good glue coverage on both the rabbits and the dados. We'll fit three sides, then add the bottom and the four sides, and we'll clamp it tight until the glue dries. All right, Austin, we've already made a couple of joints and they've been pretty straightforward, pretty easy. 
Pretty simple. Yep. Next thing I want to show you is this joint right here. This is actually called a box joint or a finger joint. Looks complicated. Yeah, well, it can be tricky. Big deal is when you put this together, think about the amount of glue surface that you have. So if these pieces are fit right and it's glued, it's very, very strong. I see. Now the trick to making it fit right is this jig right here that we're going to make. And I'll show you how to do it. First of all, I've attached a piece of wood to our crosscut fence. And I'm going to use another piece of wood that I can just lean up against it. And I'm going to make a run through the blade so that I'll have a spot to go by. Now do you have to adjust the blade height at all? Or? I adjusted the blade height, the height or the thickness of the wood. Okay. Okay, so now I've made a cut and now the cut tells me the exact width of that blade. Now I already know the width of the blade so I cut a filler piece the same size. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut off a small piece and we're going to glue it into that slot. Put it in against my guide here. Make sure it's down tight. Alright, so now the next thing we need to do is we need to get the spacing and the size for the pins. Okay. So to do that, I'm going to take the piece that's left over, put it against the edge of a tooth, bring my guide up, slide this over, firmly, but not too tight, firmly, put it there, and clamp my guide to the fence. So I'm going to take the first piece, I'm going to stand it up and hold it tight against the pin and make a cut. Now I'm going to take the piece, pick it up, drop it on the pin. Slide it over, make sure I'm down, make sure I'm tight, make a cut. All right, so now I'm going to cut the opposing fingers. And to do that, I need a pin that will fit in there or a spacer. So I'm just going to use the side that I've already cut and put it on there. Now I can take my piece and put it against it, and I have the exact dimension that I need. So when I make my cut, I'll be good. Now I take my spacer piece out, take my second piece and slide it over, make my cuts. Pick it up, slide it over. Pick it up, slide it over. Okay, so now is the time to see how they fit. I take the pieces and I put them in there. All right. Pick it up, slide it over, push it down. Okay, remove this. Okay, we're ready to assemble it. First we need to do is glue it up. So why don't you put some glue down the bottom of each slot. I'll spread it around. There's one. It goes in nice and firm. Now let's get the bottom. Yep. Good. Right down. Slide it together. All right, Austin, there you go. One box, three different joints to put them together. Well, thanks for showing me. It was fun. Uh, I really learned a lot. Well, I'm glad you did, and it was fun working with you again. Next time on Ask This Old House. There's one project in particular that I wrote in about, a gutter problem here. Oh yeah, you definitely have a gutter problem. Think you've seen everything in gutters? Well, think again. I'm taking my cues from the desert as I design a new front yard in Phoenix. And after living with technology from Future House for a year, I'll show you what we learned. This is a typical spike right here, just for the coffee maker. Thanks for watching. This old house has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.